is a Barkley Damon Live broadcast where we discuss all things L&E, labor, and employment. I'm Ari Kwiatkowski. Let's dig in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 56. This is Ridding Your Workplace of Quiet Quitting, a discussion with Peter Raybar. I am thrilled to welcome Peter to the podcast today. And I think a lot of us listening have heard a lot about this concept of quiet quitting. It's been in the New York Times. It's been talked about a bunch. And Peter is here to kind of help us through it and uh, talk to employers, management side people about what we can do to address it. So, Peter, thanks so much for joining. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Ari. It's great to be here. And uh, Peter, would you mind just telling our listeners a little bit about your experience and particularly your workplace experience and and things like that? I think that will be helpful background for them as we kind of uh, push through this topic today. Sure. Well, uh, I'm a lawyer in New York City, and uh, my my practice is predominantly working with executives as they uh, enter and exit different uh, jobs. But I also work with them a lot on on workplace issues that they encounter uh, on a day to day basis. And, you know, uh, my background, uh, I started as a a lawyer at Proskauer here in New York in the labor and employment group. And then I uh, led the employment team at Hearst, the media company, for about 12 years before starting my own practice uh, six years ago. So. I, I like to think I bring a 360 perspective to my clients, and I, I know they appreciate that. And we, we, we have great relationships as we, you know, tackle these these issues that are, are uh, present in the new workplace. Absolutely. And we're going to need that 360 perspective today for sure. <laughs> great. Well, that's why I, I'm, I'm here to bring it. So let's <laughs> awesome. dive into it. Yes. So, Peter, our listeners know that, um, and I do this just so you know to myself, if I even have a solo episode, I always ask um, our guests to just show share something interesting, fun fact about themselves. Personal or professional doesn't have to be either one, but I'm hoping you're, you'll indulge me and just Give our listeners a fun fact about you. Well, I gave this one a lot of thought because I know, you know, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. I know this is the big question, <laughs> uh, which could really <laughs> determine of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it could determine the whole course of the episode, of course. <laughs> um, I, I would say my fun fact is, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Negroni's, the, the mm-hmm. beverage, the cocktail. Okay. And uh, I like to. You uh, like it spegliato or whatever. <laughs> no, no, Just I have rest. very, I okay. have very strong opinions on how they should be prepared and. Okay. And uh, uh, so I, I don't like the spegliato. In fact, someone, a client, sent me a picture of a coffee Negroni this morning, and I, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be diving into that one. But uh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something that started over the pandemic, and I've like posted pictures of me drinking Negronis throughout the world and throughout New York City. And I think it's something that's really stuck with me because everyone I know sort of sends me pictures of Negronis whenever they're drinking them. So, so uh, I, a, well, I love that. So you're an encyclopedia of information as it relates to the Negroni. That's helpful for yeah. me to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a follow-up question, but now you have your, you have me interested. I'm engaged. What, Great. What, uh, where is the best Negroni you've ever had? Well, I sort of figured as a lawyer, you would ask that question after I told you what my, <laughs> so I thought about that a lot too. Um, and I would say the best one I had uh, is at a uh, hotel in, on the Amalfi Coast in Italy, in Positano, out. Ca- called the uh, Cyrano's Hotel. And there's a beautiful bar at, on the lower level that overlooks, you know, the, the, the sea and the whole town of Positano. It's beautiful. And they also happen to make uh, a wonderful Negroni with a very important element, which is a, a designed orange peel, you know, uh, a very like curved, almost like a spiral orange peel. But, you know, I, I guess part of it's the drink itself, but but the setting, you know, can't be beat. So right. I'd say if you ever find yourself there, make sure you go and have that cocktail the hotel itself is is too expensive for most people to stay at, uh, but the cocktails are accessible to everybody. <laughs> Sounds good. I was like, is this a White yeah. Lotus situation where now it costs like three thousand dollars a night? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was like White Lotus before White Lotus. Yeah, and, right. Uh, uh, but if you if you're in New York, then go to Dante, which is uh, in downtown New York, and they have the best 
Negronis. Okay. Well, good to know. Next time I'm in New York, I'm going to have to hit it up. But anyway, let's dig in, Peter. I feel like we could probably talk about traveling Italy and Negronis for 30 minutes, but unfortunately, let's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to uh, quiet quit if you want to talk about <laughs> right. travel instead of doing your job. Yes, yes. Although right. not that we want to encourage that. Or maybe we do. You know, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> right. I'm kidding. But in any event, Peter, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, this is, I think, a kind of a hot topic right now. I think we've all heard a lot about it. Um, and I actually, I think I was I was discussing it over the holiday weekend, Um and it came up in some of my family conversations and some of my older family members in particular were like, well, what, what does that mean? So Peter, I'm looking for you to kind of tell our listeners, what is this phenomenon of quiet quitting? I, I have to be honest. It's, it's something I talk a lot about and it's something I also like dread talking about because quiet quitting is to me at least no more than this traditional debate um, that employees have had about their own work-life balance uh, on their jobs. But there's certainly several factors that are, have been going on the last couple of years that have really, um, I think, brought this to the forefront and made it uh, a, a real issue for discussion that, you know, everybody loves to name trends now. So, you know, it, it got this name, it's stuck, and we've talked a lot about it. But, you know, I'd say... Right now, what's fueling it is certainly employees, most employees have worked really hard during the pandemic. Um, as, as a lot of us know, there was basically no end point to work. There was no start work, end work. You know, you were just always on. You were doing whatever you could to help the company get through uh, the pandemic. And, you know, people are tired and they're For worn sure. out, you know. And so... So that that's one element of it is just people are really tired. And I think there's a lot of mental health issues attached to this that, you know, if you're a smart company, you're, you're really focused on that. Uh, but unfortunately, mental health issues are very difficult for companies to, to tackle in most cases. Um, and then and then the other part of it that I think is really fueling the discussion is a lot of employees just don't feel appreciated and they don't feel engagement anymore. And, you know, that's a real management issue that I think needs to be tackled is how do you connect with and engage your employees so that they feel recognized, they feel a part of the team, and they are motivated to, you know, go in above and beyond. Um, so there's a number of things contributing to this right now, but I, th I think those are the main ones. Got it. So, Peter, I'm curious because I think as as you know, I see a lot about it on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or even TikTok, honestly. And I think that there's um, kind of this notion that this is something that affects mostly younger generations. So I'm a millennial, so I'll pick on myself, <laughs> a millennial or maybe the Gen Z generation in the workplace. And I'm just curious, you know, your thoughts on that and in your conversations with management, if that's been the case, or if it's really just more of a global issue of, you know, the be, due to the reasons you just mentioned. Oh, I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, I think that's, you know, maybe the group that's more vocal about it or, or the younger sets of employees. I mean, let's be honest, they're more vocal and they're more willing to share uh, work related issues than the older generations in the, in the workplace, you know, whether it's share, sharing their salaries or, you know, sharing their promotion conversations or whatever it is, sharing their frustrations definitely is something they, they would do. Um, but I, I've, and I've seen it and I've talked with clients uh, about it in, in older generations of, of workers as, as well. I mean, it's, I think it's prevalent across the board because again, I think it's a problem of people being worn out people not feeling engaged, you know, managers needing to figure out new ways to get their employees motivated. And, you know, as we're coming out of, you know, the crisis phase of the, the pandemic, you know, everything's changed in the workplace. And I think management style really needs to adapt to that um, and, and the, the new needs of employees. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I remember the days of the pandemic where, you know, 
I couldn't work from the office because, you know, we weren't deemed essential as lawyers or an essential business. And I just felt like I was working in during the day and it was just bleeding into the evening, you know, it'd be 9 p.m. And I'm like, why am I still working? <laughs> I'm like, I guess it's because right. I have nothing else to do. I can't go anywhere. I don't, you know, so I right. think. I think that's dead on. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about whether remote work has helped or contributed to quiet quitting, but I think it certainly is a good point to make that the, the demarcation between work and life outside of work is kind of blurred. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a debate. I remember having with my colleagues when I started at, uh, Proskauer back in the day, you know, and, and when, as you know, when you start out at a big law firm, you are expected to work a lot and, you know, you're, you're uh, judged on the number of hours you bill in a particular year. So um, we, we would have talks about how we could address that, but remote working has made it particularly difficult, not just because, you know, uh, you're, your day bleeds into the night and, you know, you can all of a sudden put your computer down and it's eight o'clock at night and you haven't moved. Um, but also because communication is so important for keeping employees engaged. And for a lot of managers, not all, but for a lot, uh, communicating and engaging remote workers is very difficult. Um, and so, you know, part of what we see on the management side is, well, the pandemic is over, just come back, everything go back to normal. And, and that's the expectation a lot of managers have, except nothing is normal. Nothing is what it used to be. So why should work be the same? Um, and they really need to adapt their engagement strategies with, with employees to keep them motivated. And, and right now, employees wanna feel recognized, they wanna feel rewarded. Uh, whether it's financially or with a promotion or just even like a mention in a in a meeting and they want to know what's going on. So, you know, uh, with, I speak a lot with clients about just communicating, over communicating about good things, about bad things. I mean, the more touch points you have with an employee, the harder it is for them to check out and, you know, not feel engaged. But if if you're just going with the old tried and true 2018 formula, you know, then I, I think you're going to, you're going to have a gap right. in, in engagement. Right. I think that's a good point. So I think Peter, a lot of people perceive whether it's right or wrong. And, and I think there's an element of truth to it, but a lot of people perceive quiet quitting as basically I'm an employee and I'm, I'm doing the bare, the absolute bare minimum. <laughs> And I think that there's a bit of a conflict because, you know, if you're an employer, you don't necessarily want an employee doing just the bare minimum. But if you're the employee and you're doing what's expected of you, at least at a, a minimal level, you know, and nothing more, <laughs> why, why right. is that a problem or, or why should employers care about that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a lot of the managers I talk to now, you know, they are they just feel super stretched and tired and they're all going above and beyond um, for a variety of different reasons. And they want to see that same level of commitment from the workers. Um, you know, the problem is that doesn't come naturally for people who are newer to an organization or maybe haven't been treated fairly or uh, maybe or haven't six, seven figures. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, aren't paid much or, you know, uh, or like, you know, maybe they did work hard and that wasn't recognized by a promotion or, you know, uh, other, other means. So I think managers really need to like be careful about imposing their own values on workers. I mean, the reality is people who report to you have different priorities and, and it's on you to like figure out what they are. And, and any manager who has a one size fits all type approach, it's really, it's not going to work in 2023. It's just not, you know, I mean, employees, they have more access to information than ever. They feel more empowered than ever. You know, um, they talk to their co workers about these things. So I, you ha as a manager, you have to recognize that. And, I, and you have to adapt your style 
to really engage with the employees that you manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Makes sense. So I think you've emphasized communication a lot, Peter, but can you give our listeners um, some tips or the best ways that you think um, can help with ridding a workplace of quiet quitting, or at least preventing it if it's not happening right now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, well, communication is the centerpiece and, and trust, you know, and, and you build trust through communication and through sharing and um, through common experiences and, and, and interests. Um, I think it's important to talk to employees about what your expectations are of them and really clearly lay those out and then also understand what their expectations are of you. And for some managers, that's a really uncomfortable conversation. They feel like it should only be one way. Why should they have any expectations of me? They should be happy to have a job, et cetera. True. Mm -hmm. But they do. So it's, 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 it's better for you to know them you know, early on and understand what they are. And if they're unrealistic, address that. If they're realistic and positive, you know, um, support that. Uh, and, and, you know, I think you should regularly schedule conversations, check-ins, you know, these things are, are hard and time consuming, but they're, they're so important. And there's such an important way to not only keep your employees engaged, but give you an early sort of understanding of, of potential issues that may be in the pipeline and really deal with, with problems before they become big and, and, and messy, right? Um, that's when the lawyers come in. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so you, you want to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that's um, good advice, Peter. And I think, you know, you and I were talking about this uh, offline uh, before we started recording, but I think, you know, it's, it can be difficult for employers, managers, because, you know, if somebody is not performing or is doing the bare minimum, particularly when they've been maybe an over achiever or been performing really well in the workplace, it's tough because you can't automatically assume that that person is quiet quitting, right? I mean, they, they could have a medical issue going on. They could have a slew of other issues. <laughs> so, you know, it's tough right. because you want to, you want to make sure you're communicating, but on the other hand, an employee may not feel comfortable to some extent talking about those issues, but I think we have to put on our lawyer hats and, you know, tell everybody you shouldn't automatically assume <laughs> that it's just quiet quitting. It could be other reasons, many of which are protected or potentially protected. Right. And and hopefully if you were having regular conversations with your employees, you're, you know, you're touching on these issues and you're figuring out what they are, you know, and if you've laid out your expectations and they're not meeting them and you're telling them that, you know, that's an opportunity for them to speak with you and say, well, X is going on, you know, I, I'm trying to start a family and I'm really focused with that, or, you know, I've been dealing with a, a difficult medical issue, or, you know, I'm having a tough time, you know, with depression, you know, there's sometimes those things will come out in conversations like this. And then, you know, uh, good companies will have resources and, you know, uh, professionals to help managers deal with those situations as, as they arise, because yeah, certainly like, Mental health right now uh, is such a huge issue in the workplace. So few, com so few companies are equipped to deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. They think it's too dangerous or tricky. But you know, there are ways to be proactive about that too, and and make sure, you know, I mean, one of the things I say is to to clients is like, make sure it's not always all about work. There's some balance even within the workplace you know, whether it's social engagement or connection or wellness or, you know, other types of uh, initiatives, like those are important ways to combat quiet quitting as well. Yes. Good points, Peter. So I think we're nearing uh, the end of our time together. Before we sign off, any last uh, words of wisdom or any anything you think is super important uh, that we haven't discussed for em employers, managers to keep in mind? Um, in the context of this idea of quiet quitting. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't believe everything you see on TikTok. <laughs> uh, Even, yes, true. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, unfortunately, like with this issue and, and, and some others, there's a lot of like, 
mockery around it and you know there's a lot of uh dismissive reactions mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. from managers i've certainly encountered that i mean I, i've gone into meetings with clients where they say no one no one cares about this place anymore you know right. and and to me like that's not something to be mocked that's not something to be dealt with uh by firing everybody um to me that says like you know, my first question is always, you know, well, what are you doing to engage and, and understand what the real issues are? Are you surveying? Are you meeting regularly with people? Are you, you know, communicating your message? Are you having all hands meetings on, on regular bases? You know, so I, I, there's a tendency in a lot of managers to only want to have positive conversations and only share positive information. And I think, you know, in this day and age, like, you got to tackle the difficult ones too. Mm -hmm. And I, your employees will appreciate that. And so yes. I, I would say, you know, uh, don't, don't get caught up in the trends, really dig in and figure out what's going on at your company, have the difficult discussions, make the right decisions for your business without, you know, uh, too much outside noise. Yes. And always call your lawyer, always call your lawyer <laughs> for advice on how to do yes. that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Peter, thank you so much. I, I think this was great. Um, a lot of good information, a lot of good things for our listeners to keep in mind, um, you know, with this quiet quitting concept in the back of their heads as they communicate with employees and make employment decisions. So thanks again so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun uh, discussing this with you. Yes, my pleasure. And to our listeners, for our next segment, we're going to try to demystify COBRA and some employee benefits related issues. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Tune in. Thanks. The Labor and Employment Podcast is available on BarkleyDamon.com, YouTube, and all your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen. Thanks.